welcome back. I'm your host Natalia and we're in conversation with Pastor Jeremy. Thank you so much for your responses. We really do appreciate it. And if you're new to this channel, do give us a like and subscribe. So last weekend's sermon was about the Lord's table. And so before we begin with today's content, Pastor Jeremy, would you briefly explain why is this the most important symbol, tradition, ritual in a Christian's life? Connected to that thought, could you also explain if this is the same as prasad as an offering similar to the Hindu religion? Hi Natalia, good to be back and uh, this podcast is taking off. I'm loving the responses and the questions people are asking. I'm loving the the assurance and uh, the reassurance that people are giving about not only listening but passing it on to people who uh, might need to hear and ask these questions. You know, we all grow up and uh, we assume a lot and because of our faith we definitely want to come across as undoubting and unquestioning. And uh, in the middle of all of that, some questions never really get answered and what we want is to get to the bottom of why we believe what we believe and that's why i feel no question is beyond limits no question negates your faith no question questions your faith in fact faith questions and questions with a view to believing so i just love the questions that are coming our way and we need to go back sometimes to the very fundamentals of our faith which is the things we do why we do that and the things we expect are looking forward to and why we do that and one of those things we picked up was communion we love communion we highly value communion it is a it's a deep meaningful task that activity or custom that the church does together but what does it mean how what is uh, what does it do for us and why is it supposed to be a priority for the church and i was able to cover some of that this past weekend and of course you can always go back to the podcast and listen to the sermon there if you missed that and uh, if you found it helpful uh, like and subscribe if you found it helpful pass it on to a friend prayerfully hoping that it would touch their lives as well communion is an act that jesus himself commanded us to do he personally said it and he connected it between the past and the future standing there at the head of the dastarkhana the table with the meal the last supper the passover supper that he would have with his disciples he stood between the past and the future he stood between heaven and earth and in that cross section of time and eternity the past and the future jesus said that all that was ever done especially the passover was looking forward to what was about to happen in the next week where Jesus would go to the cross die shed his blood and uh, rise again and the future which is when the body of Christ the church the ecclesia would be gathered together around the lord's table in heaven for what we call the marriage of the lamb or the banquet we are going to celebrate with him and he says after this i'm not going to eat with you or i'm not going to drink of the fruit of the vine till i sit with you at that table Amen. the assurance the surety with which jesus spoke those words like he was going to die he was going to rise again he was going to bring about these events and he was going to sit at that this this table was going to be a repeat performance but in heaven the table that he was hosting that moment was going to be a repeat and it was going to be a complete change a transition from being a passover feast looking back to being a celebration feast looking forward and the people of the lord the people of the church the ecclesia the, the body of christ would now from this day forward those disciples from this day forward would meet not to remember the passover in egypt but to remember the passover at the cross and then to remember that we are going to do this until he comes again there is a timeline we're not going to do this forever it's not just a thing that happened and we look back it's a thing that happened in the past that makes our future certain and we are now going to wait on the lord to come back because he's going to host another meal and that meal is going to be with his children around the lord's table in heaven now till that happens we are to gather so we look back and we look forward and we commune over the lord's supper a lot more at the sermon if you uh, go back and listen to that but that's 
That's basically what I, I emphasized. And you and I need to rethink our priority. You do not go to church for worship. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, come and sing. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, you know, gather and listen to sermons or motivational speaking. But it does say, do this in remembrance of me. And it does say, when my people gather and pray. So these two commands become the fundamental purpose and the profound reason why the church gathers. The church is in two states. It's in the gathered state, it's in the scattered state. When the church gathers, what should we do and why should we do it? When it scatters, what should we do and why should we do it? Okay, so going deeper into the custom of communion and uh, what the church does, let's look at some parallels or some other interesting associated themes that come up. Every time p people want to emphasize communion, they often compare it to either prasad or langar. Prasad is not the same thing, might I begin by saying, at all. It's not the same thing at all as communion. And to use the contrast between prasad and communion is a faulty comparison. It is a faulty way of explaining. In fact, it is a, it's almost insulting to communion. Communion is the death and burial, the incredible atonement, the atoning work of Christ on our behest, and the resurrection that affords us the joy of actually doing it in remembrance of him where he himself has asked us to do that. So communion is not something you pass out. Communion is not a meal that is offered to God or to idols or to anything. Communion is a meal and it is sandwiched between the breaking of bread at the start where the host does it and the pouring of the wine at the end where the host does it and the sharing of those two things to, between everybody. If you break bread with me, if you dip in the cup with me, so it's very powerful in its imagery, very strong in its remembrance of what Jesus has done for you. When we talk about prashad, prashad is essentially the visitation of the temple, the, the worship of idols, the prashad which is usually some edible content which is offered to the idols, and the blessing of what they believe uh, idol representing gods have placed on that edible is passed on to other people and they share. The concept of sharing is there but it is just not the same thing. So don't even go there. Don't even make that contrast or comparison. There is no contrast. Another one that comes up that is similar is langar, uh, the meal that is served in, in the Gurudwara, for instance. And originally it's a Persian word. Uh, langar translates as an almhouse or A-L-M, almhouse or a place for poor for the poor or the needy, where the temple is opened up for the poor and the needy to come and eat. It's a community kitchen in the Sikh tradition, and the concept of langar is to provide everyone in need of food, irrespective of their caste, class, religion, gender. And anyone is welcome, everyone's always welcome as the Guru's guest, so to speak. Attendees are all made to sit on an equal level, symbolic of everybody being equal, and eat the same food, again symbolic, prepared on the same plates, the same mats, the same pots. Now, this is a fellowship meal, which is extension of compassion to the poor and the needy, so that no one goes without a meal for the day. No one goes hungry. Very commendable, humanitarian, lovely, but that food is not offered to any idol because there are no idols in the Sikh Gurudwara. And uh, again, it does not parallel communion at all. We do not come to the Lord's table to feed the hungry or the poor. Paul says in Corinthians where this meal, in fact, was being misused and they were coming as gluttons to enjoy a great meal together, probably at somebody else's expense. He was saying, eat in your own homes. Don't come here to gorge on great food. You eat in your own homes. You fill your stomachs there. When you come here, you're coming for others. You're coming to fellowship with others. You're coming to fellowship in my name. And when you break bread, you're going to remember that my body was broken for you. When you drink wine, you're going to remember that my blood was shed for you. And it's the opening prayer and the closing prayer and the meal together, the sitting and dipping in the cup together, that is the fellowship around me, around my table. So it's not open to anybody and everybody. It's not for unbelievers. It's not for the uh, faint of heart. It's not for the uncommitted, for the complacent, for the traditional, for the nominal Christian. The Bible warns you not to come unexamined. 
it warns not to come into the presence of the Lord, not to eat of the body of Christ in an unworthy manner, 1 Corinthians 11. In doing so, because many have done so, there is a lot of sickness and even death in the church, Paul tells the Corinthian church. So he says that's how serious it is and when you do not mess with communion. So communion is something you come, you are welcome. If you're a child of God, if you are born again, if you have the Holy Spirit in you, if you have assurance that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you belong at that table. And when you do come, you must examine yourself and you must ensure that your sins are confessed. Unconfessed sin is the problem here, not sin itself. We are always, always sinful. We are always all sinful. But unconfessed sin is the problem. And, and when you come with unconfessed sin, that means you're holding on to it you are in trouble. So these are the ragged edges of this mindset that we need to work through. And if you have more questions about it, please shoot questions at me. I would love to further uh, your knowledge and experience and, and conviction on this matter. It's very, very important. I think because we live in India, people just try to contextualize it. So I think it's very important to just know what we're exactly comparing the Lord's Table communion with. Moving on to our next thought, when churches gather for communion, it's like a family gathering around the Lord's table. That's kind of what we emphasized on. So what does communion look like in a regular family, like a regular house, mom, dad, maybe grandparents, two kids, etc.? What would that look like? Thanks, Nat. I'm glad you asked that question. I love family prayer. I grew up in a household where my father and my mother emphasized family prayer. And if I may take you back, 8.30 was our family prayer time. And you can do what you like. You could be having board exams. You could be uh, tired. You could be sick. At 8.30, the family gathered for prayer. And it went all to 9 o'clock. And up to that, we watched Humlog. And we, we ate dinner together. And, and it was kind of like a routine that brought the family together. I'm not saying that my experience and my exercise at home is the way to do it. But I'm saying that it was done in my home as it should be done. Because my father was a godly father and he led our family to the Lord's table, to the family altar every night of, of the week. And uh, we grew up with that conviction. When the Lord's people, when the church gathers, in the first century church, Acts 2020, 20, they gathered in homes every day. So they would eat a meal and they would remember the Lord every day. So there was fellowship, there was singing one to another, there was assurance, there was the reading of the scriptures, the psalms, hymns of special songs to one another, encouraging one another's faith, and there was confession, there was prayer, there was devotion to the word, etc., etc. You'll find that in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. Now, family prayer, or the local family, or the nucleus family, of course, it differs in different cultures. In our country, you would normally have grandparents with you. Normally, you would have your children with you up to quite an older age. We do not break up the family. We're not independent in that sense. So we stick together uh, no matter what for a lot of reasons. When the family is home, the family must gather for family prayer. And since it's around a table, I suggest that we connect the two. Can we see the act of communion in our homes on a daily basis? Now, the believers in the first century church, they met daily when going from home to home. So the blessing of gathering together with believers was taken from home to home to home. Uh, so, hey, tonight it's at my place, Tuesday. Tomorrow let's meet at your place. Tomorrow let's meet at her place. Every home got blessed with the gathering of the church, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of you. So the strength of that witness was the, the light of the gospel was being shared in all those different housing complexes. They were moving from home to home, and the neighbors were hearing the singing, etc., etc. Et but when you even think of just the family, when the family gathers for a meal, that meal too can be symbolic. It can be turned into somewhat of a communion experience. So that the joy of communion, that is remembering that Christ is the head of this home and the Christ is the head of this table, and remembering that confession is important. Is there anything that you need to say sorry to mom about? Is there anything that you need to say sorry to 
dad about or does dad need to say sorry to mom or you know just just conversations that break down any kind of division any kind of division so we don't go to the table we don't go to our meal with unresolved conflict we don't fight all day and then just sit together and eat it's bad for the stomach let alone anything else we don't sit at the table and discuss controversial upsetting difficult topics it's bad for the stomach it's bad for the digestive system uh, when you're eating you should be happy when you're eating you should be joyful when you're eating you should be building relationships that is not the time mom to bring up all the complaints you have about the children while the kid is eating their food to bring up everything because they have got a, you've got a captive audience they're not going to leave the table and they can't leave the table until they finish their food apparently so you got a captive audience to let fly everything that you had in the year shot of the husband so that he gets to hear what all and then he has to now be put in a position to turn on the kid all this happens it just it just happens but it's not right meals should be a happy time meals should be a time of remembering god and his faithfulness and provision meals should begin not with just a meal prayer of thanksgiving but a prayer over the family the children are gathered around the table sometimes they're 3 and 4 3 and 7 sometimes there are 24 and 27 sometimes there are grandparents around the table it is a time for the family to gather a time to pray over your children a time to bless them bless them with promises uh, have promises from scripture read out now you say oh i don't know where the promises are then read the whole bible they'll show up somewhere or the other but have the loud reading of scripture have the uh, loud reading of sa- the psalms let family members take turns to read the scriptures equate eternal food the food of the word with the food of the day okay have the food of the word first have the reading first a quick reading it doesn't take more than 5 minutes the food's not going to get cold have a quick reading say a word of prayer and thank god for the meal and then eat together happily with sincere hearts with gratitude in your hearts the meal time can be a time of fellowship where the family fellowships together think about it if you can't fellowship together as a family mom and dad dad and the kids mom and the kids kids and the grandparents maybe a cousin thrown in because of education or whatever they moved into town for whatever reason if you can't fellowship in your family how are you supposed to fellowship with god's family and if the family is the best governance unit that god has given and god has given you provision god has given you security from the time you were helpless as a baby if god has given you identity through your family if god has given you culture through your family then that's where you must first and foremost experience redemption and when you gather for family prayer family prayer could be a half hour of a little type of a service where you know singing there's the word there's explanation some families do that where every kid in the home every and the mom and dad everyone takes turns and one day is allotted to you in the week and it's your turn to read the scriptures and maybe comment on it some some for some it's just a quick word of prayer before the meal but make it about jesus put jesus at the head of the table and the father the father must put jesus at the head of the table it must come from the father's mouth that jesus is the head of this home i get my marching orders from him he is the one who tells me how to treat mom and how to treat you he is the one who says how this family should function he is the one who dictates how finances should function in this home he is the one who begins and ends the meal he is not a silent person or an invisible person and he is he is to be made visible through the smiles and the and the comfort and the words of our family members so what are meals like in our families is it a is it a time of tension are you eating and while you're eating you're discussing horrific stories or controversial themes or are you taking that time to correct your children horrible 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 idea that is not the time to be doing that meal times especially one meal in the day let's say the evening meal dinner usually the whole family is there it needs to be a rule it needs to be a law in the home that this is a meal we eat together and we switch the tv off we switch our phones off we come to the table and we focus on each other if you're running around the whole day you're sweating and panting the whole day you're busy the whole day 
this could be the time where families build and family memories go back to meals. Family conversations go back to meals. Family decisions go back to meals. These are very precious times. And usually it is hijacked by one person's mood. One person is in a bad mood, the whole family just sits quiet or bursts out yelling and screaming. Uh, one person comes to the table with a sour mood or a sour face and it affects everybody. This has to be a place where Jesus takes over. This has to be the half hour, the 20 minutes, the 45 minutes that you sit at the table. And when you sit at the table, you are not important. Jesus is important. And Jesus is more important than dad. And I shudder to say, even more important than mom. And Jesus is more important than the two-year-old. And Jesus is more important than the interrupting bell that's ringing or the phone that's ringing. There has to be that importance where the family realizes when we come to the table, we put ourselves aside and here we are family. We're members of it. If you learn that there, it will translate well into the church. If you learn it in the church, it will translate well globally because you will find family and a table to sit at anywhere you go in the world because there are believers everywhere. And there's a table waiting for you everywhere. And Jesus says, I can't wait till I sit with you and have the fruit of the vine again with you in heaven. Again, we're going to be at a table and there's going to be a seat for you. And if you can't behave yourself at the dinner table, you will not behave yourself at the Lord's table. And then you will not even prepare yourself for the eternal table of Christ. So it is imperative that families take one meal and connect it to communion. It's not communion. No, it's not communion. But it can be made into a communion-like experience because you are fellowshipping together, because you're confessing one or another. Great time to say sorry about stuff that you have done. Great time to show submission. The family shows submission to Christ by the reading of his word and by the responding to that word and maybe even praying for one another. And definitely the father praying over the children, the mother praying over the children, so that they may be blessed. This is particularly lost when the kids grow up because the kids are far more submissive and far more in your control when they are younger. But this is a great time to fellowship with adult children. Parenting is different when you're parenting a two-year-old, a 12-year-old, and a 22-year-old. When you're parenting a 22-year-old, a 24-year-old, nothing changes. You're still a parent, but the parenting changes in terms of your communication, in terms of what you're correcting and how you're guiding and how and the level of mutual respect changes. Uh, it is very top-down when it's a two-year-old. Jolly well be top-down. Some of your households, you worship your two-year-old. You need to change that. But when a 22-year-old, 23, 24-year-old is sitting around your table, you need to give them the respect and the, the honor of being an adult. Otherwise, you're disrespecting your own parenting, quite honestly. And so there is still parenting, but it's very, very different. And the table is a great place to build those relationships under the Lordship, the care and the shepherding of the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about that. All of these things are just my heart to yours, thoughts. Some of it has been my experience. Some of it I have failed at doing in my own home. But uh, it is powerful. It is powerful. And I'll leave you with this one thing. If you can't do it in the home, you can't do it in the church. Thank you for shedding light on that aspect. It could be very new to a lot of families. So listeners, if there was a new learning from today's content, let us know in the comment section if you're listening to this on YouTube or write to us at psgjeremy at gmail.com and we'll see you in the next podcast.